David and Goliath, it's probably the most well-known account in the Bible, one of the most well-known, and certainly a very popular one, very popular in children's Bibles. And if you know this one, when, when my TJ was about three, David and Goliath was one of his favorite stories, I think partly because you have to, you have to turn the page sideways to see the full height of Goliath. That's how big he is. But there's just something amazing about this story. You know, we love seeing the little guy triumph over the giant. And the, the phrase David and Goliath, of course, has become, is used often in popular culture. We, we hear it with um, sports commentators a lot, right? When the, the underdog defeats the, the reigning champion or the ex- expected winner. Um, we, when we see the, the weak defeat the strong. Um, there's so many movies that have been made about that team that you don't expect to win that wins. Or the, how many, there have been a whole bunch of like school academic movies too, right? The, the science fair team or the robotics team or the math team that, that is the underdog and then wins. We love these stories. <clears throat> really popular in film. Um, a few years ago, the writer Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book actually called David and Goliath. Have you all seen this book? And in it, he actually um, argues that the giant is actually flawed and, um, and is beatable, has a weakness that, that is what causes them to be beatable. And the underdog or the, 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 the weaker one has a strength or an ability that they just have to tap into. Um, in the case of David and Goliath, he actually argues that Goliath, um, probably because of why he was genetic, what, what caused him to be genetically so big, also probably, this is Gladwell's theory, also caused him to be, short, to be um, poor-sighted. And, and so he couldn't really see what was happening, but he was giant, so he was scary. And David, of course, had this incredible skill. He had, could use a sling incredibly accurately. A, the, slings, um, the stones for the sling would probably have been about the size of a tennis ball. And accurate slingers could sling them somewhere between, depending on, on who you ask, somewhere between 60 and 100 miles per hour. So imagine a stone coming at you at even 60 miles per hour. And I, I picture David, you know, if, if, if any of you or any of your kids play basketball, so often basketball players, kids will spend hours on the court practicing their shot to perfect their shot so they can make a shot from anywhere. I picture David in the field with his sheep, with his sling, when things were quiet and the sheep were just grazing, practicing with his sling. Just imagine how many hours he had spent. He could hit that tree over there or that boulder over there. He knew what he was doing. He had this incredible skill. And so Gladwell makes this argument. He had this skill that Goliath had this weakness. But either way, whether it's just we love seeing the underdog win against all odds miraculously, or, and I don't mean, I shouldn't have done that. Like sports commentators will use the term miraculous about sports. I'm not, I'm not saying this is not, let me back up. (laughs) Whether we see the story from the angle of the underdog winning or um, Gladwell's theory of the reason why the Goliath loses, it's still, about, it's still about the little guy winning, right? That's usually the focus we have on this story. But I'd actually like us to have a different focus when we look at the story. I want us to think about not so much how David beats Goliath, but how it demonstrates, how he demonstrates in this account what it means to be a person after God's own heart. Last week, we started a new series looking at the life of David and what it means to be people after God's own heart. And while we're not saying, of course, that David is without flaws, we know that David makes a lot of mistakes, but throughout his life, he's still called a man after God's own heart. And last week, we looked specifically at his anointing as king. And I'm not going to recap all of that, but I just want to remind us of two really important things. The first is that when Samuel, who was called to anoint the new king, goes to Jesse's house, God tells him, that none of David's older brothers are the anointed one, despite their height and their kingliness. And then Samuel, or God says to Samuel, excuse me, for the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. God sees things differently, and we are called to see things the way God sees. That's the first important thing. And the next is that when David is anointed, it says that the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. David is chosen and empowered, and he lives knowing that he is empowered, even though it's years until he is actually crowned the king, until he replaces Saul. David is chosen because God sees his heart. He sees who he is, his character. And now in this account with Goliath, we start to see that playing out. So here we are in this battlefield. 
that Daryl just wrote, read for us. And I want to give us a little context. So the Philistines um, had been at war with Israel for a long time. There are, there are accounts of battles in the book of Judges and earlier in, in 1 Samuel. There's been this ongoing tension and violence between the two nations. And in fact, in 1 Samuel 14, it says that all the days of King Saul, there was bitter war with the Philistines. So this is not a new um, phenomenon. There's been an ongoing tension. But we've also seen earlier in 1 Samuel, we saw Saul's son Jonathan defeat the Philistines miraculously. So the Philistines know that they can be beaten by Israel. But now here in this moment, the Philistines who had actually, a lot of people think that they actually came to the, the Mediterranean coast from Crete or from Greece. And they, so they, are, they live west of Israel along the Mediterranean coast, but they want access to the east. So this valley of Elah is actually a really good place for them to gain that access. So they've actually invaded. It says they are in Judah, which is part of Israel. They've invaded Israel, and now there's this, this battle scene that we heard described. So we've got the Philistines on the southern side of the valley and the Israelite army on the northern side of the valley. And what's interesting is neither side is attacking. I think the Philistines know there's something about the Israelites. They've seen themselves defeated through the power of God. But the Israelites are scared of the Philistines because they actually have something, even before Goliath, the Philistines have something that they don't have, which is way better weapons. It actually says in 1 Samuel 13 that there were no blacksmiths in Israel. They, they would actually take their, their farming equipment into, into the Philistines to be sharpened because they didn't have those skills because the Philistines were trying to prevent them from having the kind of weapons that they had. So they're at a huge disadvantage. But nonetheless, the Philistines are here, the Israelites are here, and nobody's attacking, and then out comes Goliath. And as you heard, it's a really interesting description. We hear a lot more about Goliath than we do most any other character or figure in the Bible. This, this like detailed description of his appearance and his armor, the weight of his armor and what it's made of. It's this very elaborate description showing us that here is something to be reckoned with, someone to be reckoned with. And there's also a word used about him that is only found in this account, which is the word Champion. This is the only place where that word is used. And that word champion means, in the Hebrew, it means someone who stands in the space between the two armies. So Goliath has stepped forward into that space, and he is saying, you send your champion, and if I win, my entire army wins, but if you win, your entire army wins. So that's, that's the challenge. But another really interesting thing, if you think about this story, we often think, okay, this happens, Goliath comes, David shows up, and we know what happens. But actually, what we've just heard described with Goliath stepping forward, do you know how long that went on? In verse 16, it actually says that for 40 days, for 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand, morning and evening, morning and evening. So he would come out in the morning, make this challenge. No one would step forward. No champion would come forward from Israel. He would go back. He would come out again in the evening and again. So for 80 times, the Israelites have heard this challenge, but nothing has happened. It's, it's sort of an odd scene. They're at this impasse. There's the, the battle, the, the army on this side, the army on this side, but nothing's happening for 40 days, except that they're being berated by Goliath. And then David arrives. So David is described as a youth. That means he's under 20, and his older three brothers, his oldest three of his seven brothers, are serving with Saul's army. So they are here, and his father sends him with provisions. Uh, somebody was joking about, he's the Uber Eats of the time, David. He goes, he's bringing, and it's, it's quite specific, it, actually, it says he brings an ephah of roasted grain and 10 loaves of bread, and then he brings 10 cheeses for the commander of his brother's unit. You know, you got to keep his brothers in good graces by slipping some cheese to the commander. Um, so, and he's been doing this, been, he's, it says he's been going back and forth from Saul and his sheep. And it's about a 15-mile distance, so he's been making this trip back and forth to bring provisions to his brothers. I mean, they've been 40 days or more in this army just on the side of a mountain. And then he's bringing word to his father to assure his father that they're okay. Um, so at this moment, I'm going to read from 1 Samuel 17. It says, And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took the provisions and went, as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment, this is interesting, as the host was going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry. And Israel and, the, excuse me, Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. So isn't that interesting? Every morning, they line up for battle. They're ready to attack, but then nobody does anything. 
And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up and came, excuse me, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. So it's such an interesting scene. Every day they've been lining up for battle, prepared for the other side to attack, but then no one attacks. Out comes this Goliath, and then again the Israelites run back in fear. Well, the reality is, in this moment, they should have had a champion. Who was the champion that should have come forward to fight Goliath? The king. King Saul should have come forward. King, king Saul is described as being a head above all the other men. So he's also really, he's not as tall as Goliath, but he's really tall. And it also, where it says that, that there were no blacksmiths and the soldiers didn't have arms the way that the Philistines did, there were two guys who did, Saul and Jonathan. So he had the weapons. He had the strength, potentially, but he had the same fear as his army. And all he was willing to do was to keep offering a reward. And he probably was umping, upping the reward. I'll give you this much money. Okay, I'll give you this much money and one of my daughters. Okay, I'll give you this much money and a daughter. And you don't have to pay any more taxes. He kept upping the reward, but no one was willing to step forward because he was the one who should have stepped forward. But he no longer has the anointing. David has the anointing. And so we see something different about David. David is not fearful. He does not run away. Here we see some really clear things about David's heart. We see that he is passionate about honoring God, and we see that he is steadfast in trusting God. He wants to honor God, and he knows he can trust God. So we're going to look at those two things. He is passionate about honoring God. We see this in the first words that David speaks. This is the first time in the Bible that we hear David speak. And he says, questioning the other soldiers, or the soldiers, he says, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Like God, when David was anointed, David does not look on the outward appearance of Goliath. He doesn't shrink back out of fear because of his size. He sees Goliath's heart, and he sees that Goliath is a man who's willing to mock and deride the king of kings. And David is going to take offense at this. He is personally offended that Goliath would say such things. So then again, when David actually does go into the battlefield and, and confronts Goliath, he says to him, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. How dare you? How dare you talk about the God of Israel in this way? He is passionate about anyone speaking about God in this way. And his passion motivates him. And he's willing to step forward in this way, not for the prize, not for personal glory, but to defend his God. We are called to honor our God. I want to talk briefly about what that means. I did just say he was willing to step forward to defend his God. We are actually, we are called to honor God. God does not need our defense. He doesn't need our defense, but he he deserves our honor. He deserves our, our words of praise. He deserves our willingness to, to be bold for him. What it also doesn't mean, I don't think, is that we have to be Christian-y all the time. And let me explain what I mean by that. Um, by way of an example, when I, was a, um, when I was a young Christian and a student in college, I did a lot of art classes, and I wrestled with how my art could honor God. I wanted my art to honor God. But, you know, I sort of went through that season of, Wait, so every picture has to, like, have Christian symbolism or depict a Bible story or something, you know, like, in order to honor God. But, but when we do something well, when we use the gifts that God's given us, we are honoring God. When we, when we do our job well, it honors God. It does, you don't have to have a job like this one where you are sort of in Christian work. We can honor God through our work by how we do our work. In fact, we can dishonor God in roles like this one when we do it for the wrong reasons but we are called to honor God. So what does it look like to honor God in our work or in our school life or in our family life? Um, I was thinking about myself in, when I worked in a, a hedge fund for a couple years, and people knew I was a Christian, and when I first started, they, what that meant to them was, I'm not, I wasn't going to use F-bombs, excuse me, um, and I wasn't going to get drunk at parties. That's kind of what it meant to them that I was a Christian. But 
but you know, my heart was they would see something so much more. Our heart should be that people see that we honor God in the way we treat other people, in, in that we don't gossip, in that we, we, do our, we do our work with integrity and intentionality and in a way that builds the kingdom of God. That's what it means to honor God and to, to be intentional about thinking about that both in our work and in our school and in our families and in our interactions and in our neighborhood, how we grocery shop. We can honor God in all of those things. David was passionate about what it meant to honor God, but he was also steadfast in his trust in God. There's this beautiful moment when David is brought to Saul. So Saul hears that David's asking questions and that he's willing to come up against Goliath, and he brings him to him and basically says, are you kidding? You can't do this. And David gives the his defense for why he should be the one to do this. And he says that he's battled lions and bears and in protection of his sheep. He's saying, I, 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 I'm able to do this. But then he says in verse 37, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. David knows he has this skill. I picture him, you know, foom, I got it again, got my target again, foom, got my target again. But he's not relying just on his own strength. He's relying on the Lord. And I think there's something really powerful about trusting God in our strengths as well as in our weakness. It's easy to say, I need you, Lord, when we don't feel like we have the ability. But when we do have the ability, we still have to trust in the Lord. We still have to rely on the Lord and look to him rather than just rely on ourselves. We need to trust God in our strength as well as in our weakness. I think we also need to trust God, as I think David did, in a season of waiting and preparation and not just on the battlefield. David was trusting God while he was hanging out with his sheep. He had been anointed to be king, and then now he's tending sheep again. He's in the season of waiting and preparation, but he's trusting God there. So how do we trust God when we're in those kinds of seasons of waiting, of anticipating, of longing? And how do we trust God in those seasons that feel like the battlefield when we trust him to provide? We need to trust him in the same way. We see David's trust in God In his exchange with Saul about the armor, listen to this description. It says, Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor. And he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. Saul assumes that to go up against the giant, you need the same weapons as the giant. But David knows that he can trust in what God has given him, not what is expected of him. So I've been thinking about what does it mean to trust God with the sling that he's given you instead of the sword that the world thinks you should use? When do we, when do we have to recognize, what are those times when we can see, wait, God's given me, he's given me integrity. I don't have to use the cutthroat mentality that other people in my workplace use. He's given me his peace. I don't have to have the five-year plan to know exactly where I'm headed. I can trust him with my sling and not the sword. Looking at those ways in which we can trust him. He's given, maybe he's given you emotional intelligence that is what you need, not the, the high IQ that is expected in a certain situation. Think about what the Lord has given you that you can use, even if it's not what, what others expect is the thing that you need to go up against the giant, or to go into battle. David trusts the Lord. And we see this again in his words when he confronts Goliath. I'm going to read what I already read and then read a little further. He says, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. He's saying, I am passionate about honoring God. I'm passionate about honoring God, but I also trust God. He says, The Lord saves, not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. David speaks with complete assurance. How does he do that? He trusts in his God. He's seen God at work, and he's trusting God now. I have to say, though, of course, there are times when it doesn't feel like the giant is defeated. David has this moment. I think he has this assurance because he knows he has this anointing. He knows that he's going to be king, so he can speak with that kind of assurance. But what do we do when, when we're in a situation where we're not seen giants toppled? How do we have that same kind of confidence? How can we be sure that we can trust God when we don't know what the outcome will be? I think a really good place to look is in um, 
Hebrews chapter 11. A lot of you may be familiar with this chapter. It's one that's sometimes called the faith chapter or the the Bible Hall of Fame or Hall of Faith. And it's a whole list of people from the Old Testament who, who trust in God, who show faith in God. And they're all the amazing Bible stories that you are familiar with if you know the Old Testament. But toward the end of the chapter, it says this. And listen up, because I didn't put it up on the screen. So, what more shall I say? For time will fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets. I love that David is just listed in this whole list. He doesn't get his own little highlight. He's just in the list of people who trust in God, who through faith, listen to all these amazing things. They conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Exactly what David is doing in our account. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Amazing things when they put their faith in God. But, it goes on, some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. But they didn't stop trusting God. They did not see the fulfillment of the promise, but they continued to trust God. We can trust God in the same way, and we have seen the fulfillment of the promise. We can trust God in all circumstances because Jesus, like David, has stepped forward as our champion. He was the unexpected hero. He did not have the armor that was expected. He was, didn't have the physical appearance that was expected. He, we didn't read those details, but if you remember in the, in the account in 1 Samuel, David is, is, is berated by his older brother. What are you doing here? Get out of here. Jesus was mocked by his brothers. Jesus was willing to step forward into the gap. And it says, just after that passage that I read in Hebrews 11, it goes on in Hebrews 12 to say, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Let us continue to honor God and to trust God, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. In the New Living Translation, it says, looking to Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith, who, it goes on, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We can honor God and trust our God because Jesus is our champion, because he stepped forward. He defeated the greatest giant of all. He defeated death. So any other little battle, any other little giant that comes against us, we know, even if we don't see victory In this life, we know that we have victory in eternal life because Jesus has conquered death. He is our David. And so we can put our trust in him. We're actually going to close in a different way than we normally do. Katie's going to come up and sing a song over us that I just want, you might be familiar with the song, you might not. It's called Defender. And it's a reminder that Jesus is our defender. There's a line early in the song that says that, that God comes to us with the head of our enemies. If you recall in the story of David and Goliath, David, Goliath collapses when he, because of the stone, and then David, Jesus goes up and cuts off his head. It's this reminder that Jesus defeats the enemy, um, and, and we can, and all we have to do is praise him. If you know the song and want to join in, we're not going to have the words up, but feel free, and then we'll, we'll continue on to the, the Lord's Supper. But stay seated, and I'll have you stand. Um, at the end of the song. So please just receive this as a gift and a moment to reflect on what it means that Jesus is our champion.